Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. At the turn of the 20th century, many in the West were confident that they were living in the most civilized era in history. Progress had at last won out over barbarism, or so it seemed. Then the battlefields of World War I quickly proved a charnel house, challenging not just the belief in man's progress, but the limits of modern medicine. And yet the horrors of the battlefield prompted a wave of medical innovations that form the basis of modern medicine today. We are going to discuss this evolution in medicine, and we are joined today by Dr. Thomas Helling, a professor of surgery and head of general surgery at the University of Mississippi in Jackson. He is an expert on military medicine, trauma, and critical care, and the author of The Great War and the Birth of Modern Medicine. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Amanda. It's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. How would you describe the state of military medicine on the eve of World War I, and how prepared do you think the combatants were for a major war? Well, I think you, you, uh, your introduction is right on target. At the turn of the century, in the first decade of the 20th century, people did really believe that they were living in the most civilized of societies. In fact, uh, at the end of the 19th century, the era was called the Belle Epoque, the beautiful era. Uh, civilization was exactly where people wanted it. They thought they were far away from the barbarism of the previous centuries and that humans were acting um, more superhuman than before. That, of course, was nowhere near what the truth was. As far as the medical part of military activity, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was much like it was at the end of the 19th. Conflicts in the 19th century were fairly predictable affairs. I mean, blood, uh, battle and war is never uh, pretty. Uh, it's always tragic, but it was the sort of behavior that was expected of military men. They were uh, very uh, regal in their uh, outfits and their tactics. Men were expected to uh, advance towards the enemy with their bayonets and all in a line. Uh, and uh, the, f the fact that there was the threat of mutilation and death was still there, of course, but, they, but the likelihood of that was sometimes remote, and the wounds that were suffered from the rifles of the time were very often easily treated. Uh, not always, but very often. So, so battle was more of a ceremonial affair sometimes than it was brutality. And everybody expected at the beginning of the First World War that that would be the situation. The infantry tactics were much the same. The, the men massed in long uh, lines of, uh, of infantry and advanced towards the enemy. The medical care of casualties, with that in mind, the medical care of casualties was fairly uh, modest. The casualties were not uh, usually incurred in large amounts. Uh, the, the wounded men were transported to the rear in some predictable fashion and treated uh, in first aid stations with uh, minimal uh, effort. The general thinking at the time was that the bullet wounds of the day were probably fairly innocuous and that anything that the surgeons did uh, when they were first uh, treating the the victim would probably just make the situation worse. So they were advised to kind of keep hands off and let sort of nature take its course. Any meddling in the wound was thought to just invite infection. And that, of course, would make the situation far worse. Most of these bullet wounds healed fairly well. There were obviously complications at times, you know, bony fractures and blood vessel injuries and things like that that made, you know, problems later on. But um, the care of the wounded uh, was thought to be at a, at, a, at a point where these casualties could be easily managed. What changed with the, with the beginning of the Great War? Infantry tactics simply did not match the advance in weaponry that occurred in the first decades of the 20th century. 
Uh, people were unaware of the effectiveness of rapid fire uh, weapons such as the machine gun. They were uh, unaware of the devastation that could be uh, uh, wrought with uh, high explosives and large caliber ar artillery. So when those standard infantry tactics were used, when men advanced towards the enemy in 1914, uh, they were met with a much more vicious response. Um, the machine guns, the rapid fire uh, weapons that uh, put out um, hundreds of rounds per minute, the devastation of high explosives um, that sent um, shrapnel and fragments of metal whizzing past the infantry at high speed, uh, absolutely uh, mutilated these advancing lines of infantry. Casualties were exorbitant, and the types of wounds that were encountered were no one had ever seen anything like it. So the effect on the medical response uh, was twofold. Uh, number one, the, the number of casualties exceeded anybody's expectations and, and absolutely overwhelmed uh, aid stations at the front. And the second problem was these wounds were not the clean bullet wounds of the previous century. These wounds were wounds that tore at tissue, a vulse tissue, literally took out chunks of human beings uh, so that the ability to manage these victims in the standard fashion was completely inadequate. So you had numbers of uh, terribly wounded men uh, mounting up in the aid stations and no effective way to transport them to rear areas where ordinarily the, uh, the surgical repair would start. Now, how far to the rear? Well, miles and miles away. The standard rationale was that you you give minimal care at the front lines and you wait for evacuation systems to load up the patients and take them usually by wagon or uh, railway uh, miles to the rear where these uh, standard hospitals could then, in safety and relative comfort, uh, repair the wounds if they needed repairing. Well, that certainly was inadequate in the opening days of the Great War. Uh, the number of casualties exceeded anybody's ability to manage. The transport systems to rear areas were totally inadequate. Uh, men lingered waiting for either wa uh, horse-drawn wagons to take them to the rear or lingered waiting for railway cars to load them on and take them to the rear. And even when they arrived at these rear area hospitals, they frequently languished on um, uh, at, in railway stations waiting for wagons and other transport mechanisms to take them to the hospital. So they had horrible wounds. They lingered for days and days without any adequate treatment. And when they did get treated, the ability to care for some of these horrible wounds was totally inadequate. So it's pretty clear that World War I was very challenging for medical professionals. You've talked about uh, the, the types of wounds are different. You've talked about the number of wounded being a lot higher than in, in previous conflicts. Um, and then you've talked about the idea that the standard treatments of the time or perhaps the transportation to get the care you need um, was inadequate. Were there any other challenges for medical professionals outside of those? The fact that the wounds were neglected caused uh, problems. And I, I didn't mention that the wounds were, were oftentimes uh, inflicted in the mud and the grime of the French countryside. And of course, in farmland, what do you, what do you use to grow your crops? You use manure. And the soil was heavily contaminated with manure. And the wounds were contaminated with the soil. And before they could be cleaned, which might be days later, the bacteria in the manured soil began to infect the tissues themselves. So early on, what was seen was this horrible uh, infection called gas gangrene, which literally ate at living tissues uh, to the point that it overwhelmed the, the body's uh, defense mechanisms and death was a, a quick solution. Uh, so numbers of men suffered this horrible affliction of gas gangrene. Uh, they suffered terribly. And at first, nobody quite knew how to deal with it. Even amputating the limb sometimes was not enough and or was not done in a uh, early enough to prevent the spread of infection throughout the body. So that was a major problem in dealing with some of these wounds uh, caused by um, artillery and by um, other rapid fire weapons such as machine guns and so forth. 
And the type of wounds, again, uh, the numbers and the types of wounds were never seen before. Mutilation, not only to the extremities, but to the face, to the chest, to the abdomen, uh, and even injuries to the brain uh, were all seen in such numbers uh, during the Great War that there was no real effective or systematic surgical uh, treatment of these at first. In your book, you argue that World War I is the father of modern medicine today. Can you give us a list of medical fields that are born out of the war? The first one I talk about is the field of bacteriology or microbiology. Uh, it's not that bacteria weren't recognized at the start of the Great War. It's just that they people didn't really know to how to apply the basic science uh, that that did exist at the time. And the Great War furnished an enormous amount of clinical material to uh, enable clinicians to figure out ways to address these horrible infections they were seeing. Um, gas gangrene, for example, was not a completely new entity. It was seen in civilian practice in the previous century, but in such rare uh, numbers that people didn't really understand exactly how that worked. Fortunately, there were some bright individuals at the start of the war who applied what they did know about these infections of bacteria in the soil to what they were seeing in combat and decided that the effective way to treat these was to get rid of that contamination as soon as possible and leave only healthy tissue behind. And that, in fact, was the major advance in wound care during the war. And that's that's a practice that still exists today in the military. Uh, wounds of this nature, we still see, you know, high explosive type wounds in military medicine during wartime. Wounds of this nature have to be addressed early. They have to be cleaned thoroughly. The bad tissue and all the debris that enters from the wound itself have to be cleaned out and and healthy tissue restored. So um, that began in the First uh, World War, in the Great War. There are a, a number of other advances, of course. Radiology, the use of x-rays, was something, again, that was known before the Great War, but clinicians didn't really know how to use it. Uh, some of these x-ray units uh, existed in hospitals, but they were relegated to the back room because nobody really understood how it could be used. And uh, some of the machinery was so complicated and awkward that it just wasn't uh, employed very often in, in standard uh, hospital care. With the advent of the Great War, there were uh, it, it wasn't long before people realized that there was use for this device that it could be big help to clinicians in uh, assessing the types of bony injuries, fractures, and so forth that were seen from battle, and even the amount of metal and other foreign material that had been uh, blown into um, uh, arms and legs and heads and chests that would enable the surgeon to retrieve those and clean the wound. The efforts of Marie Curie, uh, who was, a, of course, Nobel Prize winner and her work on radium, in mobilizing these units and being convinced of their effectiveness at the front was key to uh, bringing X-ray units to the front lines and helping surgeons in their early care of uh, wounds. Um, and in terms of other uh, types of care, the, the treatment of injuries to the brain uh, was something that advanced during the Great War. Brain surgery was, as you can imagine, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, something that most surgeons stayed away from. Uh, the results were almost uniformly bad, and it, they felt it was just best to leave brain disease alone. Thanks to the efforts of the American Harvey Cushing and his meticulous technique of, of exploring uh, injuries to the head, to the skull, to the brain, helped clinicians realize that surgery to the brain could be safely performed if it was done in a very careful, planned fashion. Likewise, the development of plastic surgery had its roots in the Great War, uh, and that was mostly concerned with the types of facial injuries that were seen in the war. Now, why were there so many facial injuries? Well, 
ordinarily, uh, once trench warfare started in uh, 1915 or so, men were confined to the trenches. Rarely could they uh, peek their head above the trench and look around. And when they did, there was usually a sniper on the other side who was very willing to try to blow their face off. And that happened a number of times. Uh, Artillery contributed to that, too, because explosions above the trenches sent shards of metal down on the men, and and a number of these men suffered facial injuries. You can imagine the, the mutilation that might have resulted from that, and in fact, there were a number of casualties with disfiguring facial injuries. How to reconstruct these uh, was the was the greatest one of the greatest challenges of the war to restore these men to some type of respectable appearance so that they could interact socially. Some people develop masks that these men could wear, but there were but uh, others were more aggressive and developed techniques to actually reconstruct the face to use a. Uh, uh, but tissue from elsewhere in the body to restore fullness to the face, to restore contour to the face and functionality. And um, that was essentially the start of what we now recognize as plastic or reconstructive surgery. Uh, much of our cosmetic techniques uh, started uh, during the Great War as surgeons realized how to move flesh and muscle and bone around to, uh, to restore facial appearance. With respect to psychiatry and military psychiatry in particular, the phenomenon of shell shock was first realized during the Great War. Uh, at first, uh, people were perplexed why these men were appeared shaken and nervous and almost distor- disoriented. Uh, the initial thought was that maybe the concussive effect of high explosives were was damaging the brain. And, and I think some of these men, in fact, did suffer from traumatic brain injury in that regard. Many of them, however, just simply suffered the psychological effect of prolonged combat. You have to sort of realize that trench warfare was different than the standard infantry tactics of the previous century. Before, men kind of in a camaraderie fashion lined up and marched towards the enemy uh, with some um, purpose and uh, with some pride. Usually those encounters with the enemy were were brief and, and limited, even though they might be terribly vicious at points. Uh, and then men could regroup and, and safety uh, prepare for the next conflict. And in the Great War, in trench warfare, that was not the case. These men hunkered down in trenches. They, they had little control over their activity. They mostly just tried to weather the artillery barrages and the uh, sniper activity of day-to-day life. Uh, they never really did know when that artillery shell would land above them, and that would be the end of their life. Uh, it could happen uh, in times of tranquility. It could happen when they were eating meals. It could happen during, while they were trying to sleep. It was just simply a terror to f- try to uh, adapt to that kind of c- constant danger. So that being a soldier was not necessarily anything that mustered any courage. It was a matter of simply surviving. So what happens day after day after day with this type of routine? People actually go a little crazy, as you might imagine. And this is what the um, military doctors were experiencing. Men would uh, come out of the trenches uh, almost in idiotic fashion, mumbling and uh, sometimes even paralyzed for no good reason, terribly depressed, agitated. They they were clearly not fit to stay with their comrades in the trenches. They were uh, very liable to panic everybody. So they were taken to rear areas and uh, examined. They initially were thought to be cowards and shirkers and labeled as such when, and that was an that when that was couldn't be further from the truth. These were very courageous men who many times have already done heroic deeds in the trenches and simply after a period of time could no longer uh, compensate. So uh, while this was init- this this disorder was initially called shell shock because uh, people thought the the shock of the shells traumatized the brain, eventually it became more of a psychological issue of prolonged vulnerable combat. And uh, 
fortunately, there were wise military doctors who recognized this, who recognized these men were not cowards, and simply recognized that this was the effect of prolonged combat. And these men were given the proper care that that they deserved in specialized hospitals. The the uh, many of the techniques of psycho analysis and psychotherapy were developed in this time. Talk therapy was uh, key to allowing these men to um, express the the terror that they had uh, kept inside for so long. Now we recognize this phenomenon as post traumatic stress disorder. It is a consequence of prolonged combat. I think military doctors are now very much aware that a man uh, or a woman in combat is effective for only a given length of time. And after that, if they don't get some rest and and a rehabilitation, this is going to happen. So I would imagine those are some of the, the more notable advances in medicine. There were there was one other one that that was that that was kind of interesting. Um Believe it or not, we think now that fractures of the leg are pretty uh, pretty easily treated. Uh, we see many of, of these with motor vehicle collisions, but but during wartime, they're they're often seen with bullet wounds and and artillery wounds. In the Great War, though, fractures of the leg, particularly of the thigh, we call them femur fractures, were deadly occurrences. These men, uh, again, in the trenches, were very difficult to evacuate because the leg had to be maintained in some form of immobilization. And uh, in these uh, zigzagging trenches, that was almost impossible. The more you move the leg, the more trauma, the broken fragmented bones did to the surrounding tissues, and many of these men ended up tearing blood vessels, bleeding uh, to the point that they uh, couldn't be revived. The mortality for femur fractures in the opening phases of the Great War was over 50%. One out of every two of these men did not survive. There was one uh, surgeon who remembered that his uncle who was not even a doctor. His uncle was what they called a bone setter in, in Great Britain. He would deal with some of the, the workers on the docks in Liverpool, and uh, most of these uh, injuries and sprains he felt could be treated by rest, and he developed a splint that would immobilize the leg and place it in traction, even allowing the patient to kind of hobble around on this splint. Had it, having no intention it would ever be used uh, in military medicine. His nephew, uh, Robert Jones, remembered that splint and said, I bet this would be a good device to use for these men suffering femur or thigh fractures. So he, he sort of brought this thing out of storage and began using it in the front lines for men with this fracture. It was a device that uh, could be placed on the leg and provide at the same uh, immobilization and at the same time traction to prevent these these uh, fractured uh, ends of bones from tearing up tissue. Uh, and the men could be easily transported with this device in place um, uh, all the way back to rear area hospitals. And in fact, the device could be kept on until the fracture completely healed. By uh, by doing that, the the death rate from femur fractures dropped from one in two to one in ten. This device that we now know as the Thomas splint, because his uncle uh, was named Hugh Owen Thomas, the Thomas splint is now a, a major uh, device still used for the care of patients with leg fractures. Emergency medical uh, uh, providers carry these in their ambulances. We use them in the emergency department. Uh, they're terribly useful in the early stages of, of, of uh, treating fractures of the leg. I think one of the highlights of your book is your description of these men, and in some cases, Marie Curie, the women, who work so hard to save lives and alleviate suffering. Their passion for science, along with their patriotism in some cases, really led to some amazing medical advances. Can you highlight just a few of the others that you talk about in your book? You know, there, there, were, there were a number of 
people who contributed some of these advances. And I, and I should say that, that, I, that I do highlight uh, individuals. There are many people, and there were many people on both sides, both the Allies and the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, who also uh, developed and added to the knowledge that allowed some of these horrible conditions to be treated. One of the, the fundamental uh, principles that was developed in the care of military casualties uh, was done by a French uh, military surgeon uh, by the name of Alfred Mignon. He uh, recognized that the one of the defects in caring for casualties was delaying treatment at the front lines and allowing these men to linger without any sort of uh, wound care. And he, as a result, decided that not we should not move the patient to the surgeon. We ought to move the surgeon to the patient. So he felt that it was vital that that surgery should be performed near the front lines uh, as as close as possible without endangering the patient or the surgical team by exposing them to enemy fire. So he developed a system where he would uh, locate surgical units, not uh, not at the front, not in the trenches, but only a few miles away where the injured person, once they were seen in the first aid station, could be transported back in a timely fashion and treatment could begin. He then, once that, once the patient was then stabilized, the wound care, the wound was cleaned, they could then be moved uh, 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 some miles further away for more, rep- uh, more reparative type surgery. Uh, and then Later on, they could be transported to hospitals in in uh, the rear areas that were completely safe, and their rehabilitation could begin. Uh, so this was sort of a what they called an echelon form of medical care, a, a, a system of care that uh, uh, began near the front lines uh, and extended, if necessary. Uh, to other hospitals further to the rear. The the main point was that the patient was not neglected at any point in time and that surgical care could begin early. Now, as part of this, there was a young French lieutenant who actually was a pretty bright guy. He was a he was he was an enthusiast for the new automobile. Uh, and in fact he had developed a patent for the pneumatic tire prior to the war. And once the war began, he felt that these newfangled automobiles could be used to transport surgeons and their equipment to the front faster than horse-drawn wagons and set up surgical units at the front lines. His name was Maurice Marcel. Maurice Marcel uh, was not well connected with the aristocracy of, of French surgery. He he had been uh, he had eagerly uh, joined the army at the start of the war, and because he really didn't know anybody, he was placed in sort of a large military hospital in Paris and given a small office and said, you know, and, and was told to make himself useful. Well, he was he's he was sort of a bright, ambitious guy, and this just didn't really sit well with him. His idea of using the automobile to transport surgical care to the front was almost irresistible. Uh, the The medical establishment didn't think much of it. He went to one of the uh, rich socialites in Paris, one of the duchesses who had been left with a vast fortune. Uh, actually, her her fortune came from uh, the champagne industry. She was in. She was also an automobile enthusiast. In fact, she was the first female in Paris to get a driver's license and also the first female in Paris, I believe, to get a uh, a speeding ticket going something like 15 miles an hour, which was thought to be way too fast for the automobile. Anyway, so she and and Marcel hooked up. She was intrigued by his uh, idea and he was intrigued by her money. And uh, she enabled him to develop his first uh, trans, uh, his first mobile surgical unit. So he uh, gathered some surgeons and assistants and and uh, put his unit together. Uh, he carried his uh, surgical uh, uh, team and and I think three or four trucks. And they were allowed to experiment with this unit. They were placed near the front lines in 1915. 
And over the course of several weeks, uh, they cared for casualties. And they did so probably fairly effectively. The problem was with his unit that he had no place for these men to recover. His concern was simply providing operating space and the ability to clean instruments and to uh, do laundry to provide uh, the proper equipment for sterile care of, of, of wounds. What happened to the men afterwards, he really didn't give a lot of thought to. And that was really the problem with his whole concept. He uh, fortunately found a uh, an estate where he set up his unit and the men were placed in the um, the estate called, you know, they were placed in the chateau without any real preparation. And, and the conditions inside, once the casualties accumulated, were not the healthiest conditions. In addition, he, he, he was a little close to the front lines, and the men who had just been wounded and were laying there incapacitated could still hear the approaching artil artillery shells and gunfire, and it really spooked them. His unit was visited by some high-ranking medical officials in the French military uh, service. They talked to the recovering men, they observed uh, the procedures that were being done, and uh, they were not impressed. Uh, in fact, uh, they, uh, Marcel and his team were told to stop their activity and, and return to Paris with legitimate concerns. The fact, though, that he had little connection with um, the hierarchy of French surgery uh, didn't help. In fact, when this was reviewed, uh, he was almost drummed out of the Corps because they felt he was not, he did not manage his unit well. He did not have facilities for the men to recover from their wounds. And his uh, whole concept of early surgical care from these mobile surgical units was put into question. Fortunately, a distinguished French surgeon who was well connected with uh, French medicine in Paris came to his aid believed in the concept and helped him and petitioned to, to the French surgical societies to allow him to reorganize uh, and reconfigure his surgical units, which they did jointly. And those surgical units, those mobile automobile-based surgical units were uh, again employed near the front lines, became a standard feature of military surgery during the Great War, adapted not only by the French but also by the American units when they uh, arrived in 1917 and, and, and even uh, by some British uh, military medical units. Marcel sort of uh, took a, a backseat, of course. He really didn't have a personality that lent himself to consensus building. And um, he was sort of given, you know, these odd jobs uh, and, and received little recognition for what he had conceived of in the opening days of the war uh, until the war was long over, uh, at which time uh, they recognized uh, his brilliance in, in arriving at this idea of providing surgeons at the front lines. And of course, now this is a, the, the present day mass units and mobile surgical units that we hear about from the Korean conflict and from Vietnam and even now from the, the recent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq are the or, or a direct result of Marcel's concepts uh, in 1914. Well, we've covered the use of gas on previous podcast episodes with historians, but I'd really like to get your medical perspective on it. Now, nothing really evoked primal terror more than gas, despite the fact that artillery killed far more troops than gas did. What types of gas were used on the battlefield in World War I, and how did medical professionals respond to this new challenge? The first use of gas uh, was in 1915 against Canadian troops uh, in France. The use of gas was not a novel idea in the First World War. There had been experiments with the use of gas um, prior to that. And this had been discussed at some joint um, conferences as a more humane weapon, actually, than bullets. The, the argument was that gas, was, while gas could incapacitate, it did not maim or kill in, with the brutality of bullets and ar artillery shells. Well, that didn't sell well, uh, and, and there were a number of opponents to legitimizing the use of, of chemical weapons in military 
conflicts. Uh, with the start of the war, the Germans uh, began developing uh, their ability to use chlorine gas uh, as a way to uh, frighten and disarm troops and temporarily incapacitate them so that the infantry could advance and take over their territory without suffering horrendous casualties. And uh, they they used the you know, they used chlorine gas from cylinders that depended very heavily on atmospheric conditions and the and the direction of the wind. Uh, their first use of the, this uh, chemical weapon, chlorine, uh, was very effective. The Canadian troops uh, had no idea it was coming. Uh, they a number of them choked and actually died in their trenches uh, because they couldn't figure out how to protect their lungs from this. Uh, chlorine gas is a terrible is terribly irritant irritating to the to the throat and lungs. If it's if 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 prolonged exposure, uh, the lungs will fill with fluid and the and the and the victim will basically asphyxiate. So you have two choices. Uh, actually, you have three choices. You could find something that filters out the chlorine gas. You could you could stay where you are and and try to weather the 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 clouds of, of poison gas, and that will usually be unsuccessful. Or you could get up and run. And most of them got up and ran. They didn't have the gas mask that we think of now as as characteristics of the, of the First World War. And the first uses of gas, people tried anything to um, protect their lungs from the this irritating chemical. Uh, some uh, were even advised to take cloth and urinate in it and use that uh, over their mouth to uh, filter out the chlorine gas, which actually was effective, but not terribly popular. So the opening phases of the use of chlorine gas from the cylinders was was terribly effective until people figured out uh, that there could be uh, more more efficient protective devices, gas masks, that they could use. And they, of course, uh, were troubled by the fact that if the winds weren't blowing right when the gas was released from the cylinders, it was just as likely to blow back on the troops that were trying to... Um, attack the the enemy with it so um but uh, they both sides felt that it was still a fairly effective weapon uh not that it would completely annihilate the enemy but that it would disable them uh so that infantry could more easily take over uh, their trenches and expand uh their uh, holdings uh using uh, releasing these from cylinders of course was not not the most effective delivery method. So uh, they began to put the the the, uh, the cylinders in artillery shells and fire those shells, and that was much more effective. And in fact, um, more than trying to disable the frontline uh, troops, the the enemy quickly realized if they could disable the the enemy the the uh, other sides artillery units, um, that would be a great benefit to uh, frontline troops. When you realize that most of the wounds, almost 85% of the wounds in the Great War were caused by artillery and not by guns, uh, rifles, um, one can understand the desire to disable the enemy's artillery. And using these uh, gas-filled artillery shells fired in the rear artillery areas uh, was very effective in um, disabling the enemy's ability to use their uh, heavy guns. So that was the second phase when they were incorporated, and and the and the chemical was still mostly a, a, the respiratory irritant, chlorine or or phosgene was another derivative of that. They were not the major weapons that caused uh, uh, casualties from chemical warfare, though. In 1917, I believe, the effectiveness of mustard gas was fully appreciated, and uh, mustard gas was then used in artillery shells to uh, pepper the uh, other side's uh, troops. Our, uh, mustard gas was, was not really a gas, though. It was an aerosolized uh, compound uh, that was was irritating to not only the lungs, but the, the skin and the eyes. Um, it would settle on the skin and the eyes and cause blistering, uh, uh, temporary blindness. And if it was inhaled, of course, it could cause respiratory irritation, uh, pneumonia, even death. So uh, most of the of the 
of the chemical weapon, the gas casualties that occurred during the war were due to mustard gas. It was uh, uh, easily uh, transported, easily delivered, and once it was deposited, kind of kind of hung around uh, on the on the foliage and the uh, and the ground, so that it was hard to it was hard for troops to stay put. And you know the the fact that you had a gas mask did not protect you necessarily from the effects of mustard gas. It could irritate your skin just as easily. So. What was gas warfare effective? Uh, well, the, yes, I, I think what it did was it created more casualties for the frontline medical units and overwhelmed first aid stations and medical care facilities. There were special gas ho- uh, gas hospitals set up uh, to care for these casualties, but it put put an additional stress on the medical system. Now we know that General Douglas MacArthur was caught in a gas attack. And then we know that he suffered from kind of uh, respiratory issues, eye issues. And then months later, we believe he contracted Spanish flu. And then he ends up getting gassed a second time. How do you think being gassed and having maybe some lingering respiratory issues, how would that impact your ability to kind of fight off Spanish flu or kind of deal with the symptoms of that flu? It didn't help. Yes, I think the effect of, of mustard gas on the respiratory tract uh, was not completely reversible. I think probably a number of, of troops suffered those long-lasting effects on their lungs, and uh, certainly it compromised uh, the lung, the ability of the of the lungs to fight off um, the influenza virus. Spanish flu, of course, was not really the Spanish flu. It, the the Spanish flu actually uh, started. Uh, probably at Fort Riley, Kansas. The patient zero came probably from a small Kansas town. How he contracted the illness, nobody really knows. Um, uh, But uh, soon after he developed his symptoms, he was uh, sent to uh, Fort Riley for in-processing to the Army. And from there, uh, the disease spread rapidly among recruits. They were all packed in uh, uh, together and... um, uh, it was easy for a respiratory virus to spread that way, just like it, it it was with COVID. So it began there, we think. These men eventually found their way to the East Coast to be transported by a steamship over to Europe. And uh, further congregations of troops were ideal settings for the dissemination of the virus. We know that when these troops arrived in the in the port cities of France, can follow the progress of the virus infecting troops as they marched from the port cities to the front lines, and even transporting it across the across no man's land to the enemy. In fact, the Germans were so affected by the by the influenza virus that they felt it was a a, a bigger danger to them than the actual presence of American troops. And I think uh, uh, there is no doubt that it contributed to um, their desire to seek an armistice in 1918. Now, despite all of the other medical challenges that uh, medical professionals faced in World War I, you write that the pandemic is a very humbling experience for the medical community. Can you explain? Yes, I, I think some of these other advances that I talked about were done uh, because uh, scientists could apply their scientific method and uh, eventually come up with a proven uh, effective cure, or at least a proven effective treatment. With the flu, people didn't even know, they suspected it was some type of microorganism. At uh, first, the uh, people believed it was a bacteria. They, but they really didn't understand it. They, they, they were unable at that time in history to identify viruses. There might have been a few who suspected it could be something smaller than a bacteria, but they really didn't have any way to identify it. Uh, so they were, act, they were absolutely powerless in how to treat this, much like, as a matter of fact, we were powerless in how to treat COVID in the opening phases of the pandemic. All we could do was rely on the, the measures uh, that were developed in the in the influenza uh, pandemic of 1918 and 1919, wearing masks and socially distancing. Those were the two measures that were taken 
to try to halt the spread of this. People in the day, of course, knew it was spread from person to person. It was a contagion, but they didn't know how to treat it other than trying to prevent it. And I think that makes, with all the sophistication that scientists exhibited, trying to address the problem, the medical problems that occurred during the Great War, they could not make any headway with the pandemic. And and really, the pandemic more or less burned itself out without any effective treatment delivered by medical personnel. So as a, as a physician, I think you are terribly frustrated in your inability to actually, and of course, there were no antibiotics to treat the pneumonias that developed. So there was absolutely no treatment at all. Vaccines were unheard of. For the most part, I mean, people knew about the smallpox vaccine and they knew that that was a possibility, but they couldn't isolate the agent involved in the 1918 pandemic. They had no idea what it was and they couldn't develop an effective vaccine. There was uh, antibiotics were a distant dream and they all they could do was try to uh, counsel people in how to uh, reduce the chance of being infected. Any final thoughts on World War One and modern medicine? Well, I think if you if you look at any point in history and you first of all, what do I mean by modern medicine? I mean the the evidence based technology driven efforts of clinical scientists to identify the cause of disease and develop effective measures to address it. And we carry those principles even today with us in the search for answers to horrible things like cancer and strokes and other types of autoimmune diseases that are so troublesome in our society. When you look back in history and you try to find that inflection point, we went from the era of rather rudimentary uh, basic research uh, a beginning of our understanding of microbiology and surgical techniques. Uh, you you got to remember, by the time of the Great War, there were we were only able to do safe surgery for probably thirty or forty years, sterile surgery with general anesthesia. That was not terribly ingrained in medical practice, even at the start of the Great War. When you look at when you look back in history at that inflection point that really what was it that really accelerated the rudimentary efforts of the 19th century and early 20th century to make progress against some of the common maladies of mankind you have to invariably go to the great war as that inflection point that stimulated clinical scientists to not only investigate but find ways to apply what they learn to effective treatments. Granted, that wasn't the time when antibiotics were discovered. That was in the Second World War, perhaps. But we laid the groundwork for that. And some of the, as far as the the surgical principles to deal with the wounds of war, I think that was the key point where we finally realized how we're going to deal with these horrible wounds of modern weaponry, that we are not going to be minimalist. We're not going to be afraid to explore and probe and try to rectify the damage to tissues. We have to be aggressive, clean the wound. And and those practices carried through the Second World War. They carried through Korea. They carried through Vietnam. And they carried through Afghanistan and Iraq. Same principles, early care, adequate treatment of the wound, early surgical reparative surgery. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Helling, for joining us and sharing your expertise. Well, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.